Um, yeah, you know, I mean, it's it's good for whatever reason. I don't find myself like, oh, why did I leave? I find myself saying, I get why I left. You know, uh, I had I had a good run in New York. I'm 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 happy where I am now. You did well. We're going to talk a little bit about your run, but let me start by welcoming you to Molnar's table. This is a little bit of a come down because I know last week you were talking to Oprah, so <laughs> you have to you'll have to suffer through this, but. Welcome, Frank. Um, amazing uh, journalist, longtime New York Times uh, op-ed columnist, best-selling author. Here to talk about your new book, *The Beauty of Dusk*, which you were kind enough to send to Katie, and I saw on her bedside table and swiped it. I love that. I love that. Yeah, and, uh, and it was amazing. I got you know, I really enjoyed it. I read it maybe a month ago, and I've gone back and looked at it some more. And uh, Katie's eager to read it too. And I'm sure she'll have her own questions for you then. But how is your vision today, Frank? Um, it's totally functional. It's kind of a paradox. It's totally functional um, because my left eye is good, uh, but my right eye is kind of useless. And in fact, there was a very mm -hmm. strange moment when I um, went to get my North Carolina driver's license after I moved from New York to North Carolina. And um, uh, the way they did the vision test there, which was the only thing they really tested in order for me to swap one state license to another. The way they did the vision test was in a machine where for some reason, even though it has no bearing on whether you get your license, um, they test the two eyes independently. And I didn't realize they were doing that at first. And I, I said, why are you showing me a sheet of whiteness? And it turns out what that was, was just my right eye. And that's how useless my right eye is. Wow. But some people in my situation will patch the eye. Um, mm -hmm. I haven't done that because what I'm told and what has proven true incrementally is your brain starts to patch your eye for you. Um, and so I can get by pretty well with just my left eye. Um, there are moments when, um, when things are a little bit swimmy. Um, there are typos that I cr commit that I never did before. You know, when you go to a New York City subway station and you are getting a Metro card and you have to put your finger on the screen, like in the box that says whatever you want, mm -hmm. it'll often not behave for me. And it's because my brain is seeing my finger in the box, but my finger is actually outside of the box. Well, take us back to that morning when you woke up in 2017 and, you know, you, and you, and you had blurred vision. This happened, what happened to me uh, happened overnight. Um, it, depending on who you ask, is it a stroke or akin to a stroke? Um, but basically my, my blood pressure fell for unknown reasons while I was sleeping. Um, it choked off the blood supply to one of my optic nerves and frazzled it. And, and that's what ruined the vision in my right eye. When I woke up that morning, I could, you know, because my left eye was working, I could see, but I could tell something was really wrong. There was a dappled fog over the right side of my field of vision. And it was such an odd thing because it was, because it was almost like a smear of jelly or something. I assumed that it was like my glasses weren't clean or right. some gunk had gotten in my eye. And because of that, and maybe just because of the human capacity for denial, I mean, many hours went by before I got super concerned, really a whole mm -hmm. day. And then from there on, as you mentioned, it was rapid fire. I was at one eye doctor. He's like, this is a problem too um, mysterious and serious for me. And then I was at a neuro ophthalmologist. Um, and then I was getting an MRI and I mean, boom, boom, boom. And the next thing I knew 12 days later, I was in the one existing experimental drug trial for this treatment. And somebody was sticking a needle in my eye mm -hmm. um, as part of that trial. Um, and it was a really, really scary period, but it all went by so quickly that I feel like the adrenaline or the sur surrealness of it all kind of saved me from the terror. Are you no longer at risk, the same sort of level of risk of losing vision in your left eye as you were concerned about uh, at, at the time of your original um, diagnosis? Un unknowable. The answer to that is, is no one really knows. There, there is some belief um, last time I checked and I don't update myself every week, but um, there's some belief. So that the chances, if this happens to one of your eyes, um, mm -hmm. the conventional wisdom based on the literature is that there's a 20% chance it will happen to the other eye. So, you know, the odds are with you to get by forever more with one eye, but the stakes are pretty high. There's some belief that as the years go by, if it has not happened to your other eye, that with each passing year, the odds diminish, but there's 
that's a belief more than it is a certainty or a knowledge. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I mean, I may still be living with a 20% chance of my left eye going, you know, and then I'm blind. Um, and that was a big part. That was a big part of the challenge of this. It's a, it was a, a thing I wrestle with a lot in the book, as you know, because you read it, which is how do you, how do you live with that kind of sword hanging over you, you know? Um, and one of the ways you do it, John, and, and, you know, you and Katie both have experience with this sort of thing. So I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but one of the, one of the ways you do it is to, is to realize all of us, whether we know it or not, are living with that sort of uncertainty dangling over our heads. you your, your uncertainty has been given a specific name and shape but it's everybody's uncertainty. None of us know knows what's coming for us a week or a year or a decade hence. And that's really the, the universal, universal aspect of your book that you talk about. So when I read it, you relate to it and you relate to vulnerability and to people sort of dealing with it. And then you talk about these amazing people who have their challenges. You call it your sandwich board theory, which I love. Can you explain that? And and uh, how that ties into this notion of resiliency and, and people that are, are getting on with life uh, uh, in spite of or beyond the challenges that they have? Sure, yeah. Um, so in, in the book, as you know, um, there's a chapter called The Sandwich Board Theory of Life. Um, and it sprung from my, um, my kind of learning, my observation as I, as I was dealing with this. Um, I didn't want to feel self-pity. I didn't want to dwell on that question, why me? And I also kind of knew instinctively that wasn't the right question. And I, I took a, a whole new fresh look at, at everyone around me, you know, my close friends, my acquaintances, people whom I was meeting for the first time. And I really looked hard at them and picked up on cues and, and realized something that we all should realize and I should have realized sooner, which is just about everybody out there um, has, had a terrible struggle, is struggling right then and there, um, has the scars from pain in the past, is carrying pain with them. But in most cases, you don't see it. You know, you look at me, nothing seems to be amiss with my right eye. You don't know um, that I can only see out of one eye and that I, then, and that I go through my days with the fear of going blind. Um, people who have uh, terrible mental health challenges, you, you don't see that from the outside. And I found myself wondering how different and improved maybe the world would be if all of us just happened to be wearing sandwich boards that said that listed briefly some of the main challenges that we've survived um, or that we're going through, like my sandwich board would say compromised eyesight could go blind. You know, someone else's might say, <clears throat> you know, was treated for cancer three years ago, it might come back. Someone else's might say lost my beloved spouse two weeks ago. Right. You know, we'd be a little bit more empathetic of one another, more understanding. A hundred percent. And we would be less prone to self-pity. You know, we wouldn't say, why me? We'd understand that the real question is why not me? You know, because we all, we all are going to be visited by these, by these challenges and we're all going to feel pain. I think about that a lot, John, well beyond the bounds of the book. I mean, in terms of our political culture right now, in terms of the, the coarseness of American culture right now, we are so suspicious of one another. We're so quick to judge one another. We're so unforgiving of one another. I mean, people talk about that in terms of cancel culture, but that's only one facet of it, right? Um, mm -hmm. I think we've reduced each, we, we've all reduced one another to abstractions. And I wish we understood that when someone in front of you is failing you, when someone in front of you is flailing, um, before you judge that, um, maybe wonder what that person is going through or has been through. If we could do that, um, I think we would have a much better culture, much better country. I'm curious. A sandwich board changes. What would your sandwich board have been in 2016 before this challenge? Oh, I mean, my sandwich, my sandwich, that's a great question. My sandwich board might have said, you know, um, uh, often a nervous wreck. I don't know. It might have said, um, uh, seem to gain weight at the drop of a pin and, and never lose it. And I'm consumed with, with anxiety about that. These are long sandwich boards. I guess my sandwich board is becoming a novel or a novella, but, um, I mean, it, you know, it might've said have, have struggled with depression. Um, right. uh, might've said, um, I'm convinced I love my partner more than he loves me, you know? Um, and those, some of those are small things, but I don't think they're really, I mean, they're, they're big things too. I mean, we are, we, we look around us 
and this is very central to the sandwich board thing, John, I think we're constantly measuring ourselves against other people and we're making the assumption that we have accurate information about them. We think that, you know, that we're limping along and they're on glide paths. We think that, you know, we are, um, you know, we're balls of self-doubt and anxiety and they are pillars of confidence. But those are almost always faulty assumptions. I mean, those are closer to myths than they are to accurate perceptions. Um, and I think that when, we're, when we realize that, we see ourselves differently. I think we see ourselves more charitably. Um, so yeah, my, I've always had a sandwich board. This one's just super, super specific. Well, Frank, I'm, I'm trying to take a page from your book because when I, when I get set off now, I, I, I ask what would Frank Bruni do in this situation when someone cuts me off or jumps in front of me in a, in a line or says something rude and I try to pause for a moment and say, what's their sandwich board? It's not really working, I'm trying. But it, it doesn't. Know, it doesn't always. It doesn't always work with me, John. And I. I do feel I've come upon some wisdom, which I hope I share in the book. But you know, to be very, to be fully candid and honest, um, my own wisdom is sometimes lost on me. You know, and when, right. you say, when you say you ask the question, "What would Frank do?" I just think that's a terrifying way to live. <laughs> I'm, I'm. 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 I'm muddling through as best possible. You know. You know it also reminds me a little bit of Mike Tyson. Everyone has a plan until you get punched in the face. And so you're saying we're all going to get punched in the face. And what do you do next? That's right. And, and that's really um, the quality of your life is in what you do next, right? I mean, uh, you, I, I thought so many times in my head, and I think I, you know, I hope I use these words in the book. Um, we have no control over what happens to us and we have all the control in the world over what happens to us. And what I mean by that is, you know, I, I could not have known um, that this vision problem I have was coming and there's nothing I could have done to prevent it. And frustratingly, it seems there's nothing I can do, um, you know, if, if it's going to get worse in the future, if that second eye is gonna go, there's not a lot or really almost nothing I can do to prevent that. I have full control over how I react to that. I have full control over my emotional response to that, or I have a lot of control over my emotional response to that. Um, I get sometimes, you know, I'm a writer, that's how I make my living. Um, I get hugely frustrated that what happened to me affects that so directly, that it takes me longer to read something, it takes me longer to write something, I have to budget in time to circle back and look for all the typos that were never there before. And when I'm focused on that, um, I am angry, and I am sad. But it's so I don't want to say it's easy, but it's so possible to look at it a different way and say, wait a second, the fact that someone is still publishing my words, the fact that there are people out there who want to read and read my words, that's as worthy of emphasis and focus as any added difficulty in getting them out there. And mm -hmm. that's the control that we all do have over our lives. I think, you know, um, in our lives, there will be many major forks, but also many minor forks. And those forks are moments or circumstances where you can decide um, to stare at what is what you've lost, what's been taken from you, what your what your hardships are, or you can decide to steer toward and stare at your blessings and all that remains. I guess one of the uh, areas I was that comes across in your book is this notion that we're pretty good at hiding the bad stuff. And one of the things you're doing in writing this is is putting vulnerability out there. And then you talk about some amazing people who um, who we all admire. People like um, Anthony Bourdain and um, uh, um, the the Princeton uh, economist um, Alan Kruger and uh, Kate Spade, who had so much going on in their life, and I think all within a very short period, must have suffered from horrible depression and all took their lives. And, and there was really, at least outwardly. To most of us, there were no signs at all of that level of depression. Yeah, and that is that is a very, very sad and stark reminder of the misassumptions we make about other people's easy lives, other people's confidence, other people's joy versus our own struggles. Um, and yeah, that, that was all within a year. And and I remember each, each one of those being a situation where where people were like, but I but I envied that person, but I I wished I'd had that person's life, which is such a great, great um, example um, of the ignorance we're in about what people are going through. But th this happens in even less extreme ways. I think in that same section of the book, I talk about on a, on a much kind of, um, on a much less dire level, I talk about the, the quarterback, Andrew Luck. 
And I remember being really, really struck the day he held a press, and I'm a big, I'm a big football fan. Um, and I remember being riveted the day he held a press conference and announced, you know, in his prime that he was retiring from football. And with such incredible pain in his voice, and he was on the verge of crying at several moments during that, I can't remember if it was a press conference or just a media moment, um, he kind of talked about all the injuries he'd been through in his still young football career, um, all the pain he'd been through, you know, how, how much he had to worry about that, how scary that was, and why he had to give up um, this thing that he loved, but that was also such a torment and such a torture. And I thought to myself, how many young men around America have wished a million times over they were Andrew Luck, Heisman Trophy winner, star NFL quarterback, good looking, smart, went to Stanford. Um, Andrew Luck at that moment in time was not wishing he was Andrew Luck. Andrew Luck with that incredible um, ironic surname um, felt anything but lucky. And it's just so important to remember that as we take the measure of our own lives. Um, because we're taking a, a, a really dangerously inaccurate measure if we are using the yardstick of our assumptions of these charmed lives that turn out to be anything but charmed. I wanted to ask you about uh, this quality of gratitude and how important you think gratitude is across, you know, characteristics or attributes we should strive for, because that comes across so much in in your book. And I think in sort of a a, a life that is um, fulfilling and rewarding and, and, and the importance of happiness is to sort of look, as you said, with Andy, Andrew Luck at things that we have, not things that we've, we've lost. And um, I'm just curious in your take on, on that as an, as an attribute and where you put that. I put gratitude near, if not at the top, of the list. And, and it's hard to kind of rank them because I think they're all Venn diagram overlaps. You know, I think when we talk about resilience, I think one of the one of the components of resilience is gratitude, right? But I think gratitude is everything because I think gratitude's antonym in this in this instance is envy. And I think envy is a corrosive information, a corrosive emotion um, that is a surefire path and a quick path um, to unhappiness. Um, I think gratitude is everything because I think it's, it's, it's through tallying your blessings rather than your hardship that you find gratitude. And it's through finding gratitude that you are able to continue um, looking, spending more time looking at your blessings than at your shortcomings or your hardships. Um, so I think it's everything. And I think it's appropriate because in more cases than not, I mean, listen, I don't want to be a Pollyanna here and I'm not a Pollyanna. There are people going through this world with such, with, with such agonizing physical challenges, um, with so little ability to circumvent around them, um, with such enormous pain that there is no simple rerouting of my focus to my blessings. There is no simple gratitude. But I think most of us uh, have hardships and challenges that do fall into the category of we can master a lot of psychological and emotional control over them. Um, and for that population of people, I think gratitude is everything. And I know you're teaching uh, courses now at Duke on uh, related to media. And I'm, how do you size up the job that the media is doing? And what, I know that's very open-ended, but, but what could be done better to restore the public's confidence in media and truth in media? And where do we go to get our news? You know, we, we enjoy watching one network and then flipping over to the other to just sort of say, what in the world is going on? I, you can't figure it out. And I could watch, you know, one and nod my head and say, wow, you know, that's terrible or important and then turn over and get a completely different story and all, you know, and it, it's just, uh, it seems uh, that given the state of media and where people are consuming news that we have a, a problem that's just getting worse and worse. And I wonder as an expert in media, uh, do you see a way forward or do you think this is, um, we've got a long way to go to straighten things out? Well, I think we've got a long way to go because um, we're fighting an information ecosystem right now that's extremely, I mean, it's impossible to manage carefully. Um, 
you know, we hoped when the internet came along that it would be this kind of egalitarian democratizing force. And in some ways it is, but it also means that um, information flies around in, and misinformation flies around in a completely unvetted fashion. And that people encounter it sometimes not knowing its provenance, not knowing whether they can trust it or shouldn't trust it. Um, and we see that we see the kind of very disturbing fruits of that all over the place. We saw it in the January 6th uh, rioting at the Capitol. Um, I was right before we uh, got online, right before we Zoomed, John, I, um, I was kind of just flipping around and I don't, I don't know how it came into my field of news vision, but there was some story about the actress Kirstie Alley wondering if some of the images she was seeing of the Russian invasion were fake news. And that phrase, which predates President Trump, but was popularized like never before by President Trump. If you, if you kind of root around, you'll find that many Russians um, believe, that, uh, believe that portraits of Russian savagery are fake news um, and that the news media deliberately suppressed uh, Ukrainian crimes against Russian nationals who were in Ukraine, right? Um, this notion, anyone who is, who is being exposed to rea a reality that contradicts his or her version of events decides that that is fake news and what they're getting is, is different. And I don't know how, how do you overcome polarization in a situation like that? How do you fight against excessive partisanship? I mean, these are, these are some of the central riddles of our time. One thing I know we need to do, I don't know if it's gonna get us a little bit of the way there or a lot of the way there is we have to somehow encourage people through education, um, through public service stuff, we need to encourage them to be the kinds of intentional news consumers that you were just describing you and Katie being. What you said you were doing, flicking from X channel to X channel, what I do when I set up my feeds and make sure I'm getting headlines from a conservative source and from a liberal source and from this kind of, um, of analyst and from that kind, that sort of intentional and forever skeptical but intelligent consumption of information, we do have to work to encourage that in every member of the populace in a way that I think we don't. We have to teach me media literacy in schools. We don't do that. I know there's a lot that schools are already failing at, but I think this is becoming a pretty crucial and non-negotiable thing. Should these social platforms have more responsibility for the content that appears? I think they, I think they should, and they've, they've moved a little bit in that direction, but that's also a very, very tough one because, um, I would not want us to land in the realm of censorship, of classic excessive censor censorship. And, you know, I mean, let's be honest, we're dealing with really tough stuff where you draw the line um, so that you have some sort of responsible regulation, but haven't created a precedent of censorship that could end up coming back to bite you uh, when the people making those decisions are not of your ideological like mind. This is really, really difficult stuff. All right. Uh, here's another really, really difficult question. Are you dating, Frank? You talk about a relationship. <laughs> you talk about a relationship unwinding in this book, and and uh, uh, I, that was a big part of your life. And you you, may, you had so many changes. You had a health change. You changed professions. You took a, a full tenured position at Duke. I don't know how your your colleagues at Chapel Hill feel about that, but um, um, you 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 adopted a dog and. Uh, you know, and I'm just wondering as you as you as you have relocated to um, to Chapel Hill, uh, if you found somebody in your life that's important. Um, it's not a tough question. It's a very sweet one. I feel like that's a really kind question to ask. So thank you. And I will just before I answer it, just to uh, you know avoid it for one more second longer. Um, my my Chapel Hill. Um, fellow alums and colleagues have been very nice. They even asked me, I'm going to be giving the commencement address. I know you are. I was going and to I ask felt that like, that I felt like I, I've, some, I've somehow got to build that magnanimity into the address, the fact that they are welcome. You can bring Duke together Duke and, and Chapel Hill. You might be a, a man for a bigger assignment. Okay, you've been peeking at my drafts of my commencement speech. I feel like, yeah, you know, people say, can't we, can we, can we find common ground and compromise? Yeah. Well, here We're I am. We're going to test it in May. Um, I do not have anyone special. I, and I just, um, I'm just in a phase of life right now where I'm kind of enjoying being on my own. I'm enjoying having complete control over the iPad or the TV screen, um, you know, and, and if popcorn is the snack I want and there are a few kernels on the floor and I don't get around to cleaning them up until tomorrow, I, I like that I don't have to worry about that. Without preempting your commencement address, 
Um, you know, Katie wrote a book a number of years ago called The Best Advice I Ever Got. She took excerpts from these conversations that she's had with amazing people over the years where she was getting wonderful advice and she was thinking about a commencement address she was going to give. So she started soliciting advice and looking back on conversations. And I love to ask that question. What, you know, what is the best advice, Frank Bruni, you've got during your career? career. So a line that sticks with me to this moment, and it's in, in, it happens to be in the book, but um, as you mentioned earlier in our conversation, one of the things I did uh, to, to manage what happened to me and to learn from it is I kind of put on my journalist hat and I went around and interviewed people who had been through um, struggles or, or had dealt with what we call disabilities. And one of them who became a friend, a wonderful man named David Tatel, who's who just retired as a as a circuit court judge, court right below the Supreme Court. Um, he went blind when he was in, in his early 30s and and went on to have children and an incredible, brilliant career um, and on and on. And on a day when we were walking from his office to the metro and then through the metro and he was guiding me, the blind judge, more than I was guiding him. He said to me, um, he said to me, he turned to me and he said, starfish can regrow limbs, but that's nothing compared to what people can do. And it was a tribute to human adaptability and nimbleness. And I think he's right. And it's not a piece of advice, but it's an observation I keep close to heart because when you are going through something difficult, when you're worried about what the future holds, um, when you're suddenly navigating new limits in your life, um, do not un ever underestimate your nimbleness as a human being and do not ever underestimate or, or shortchange the truth of that statement. Starfish can regrow limbs, but that's nothing compared to what people can do. Given how important I think this book is and, uh, and how much better the world would be if people read it and thought about what you were saying, if you could require as a college professor, now, if you could assign this book to three people to read magically, and they and they would read it. Who would you like to read your book? You got um, Oprah, so I'll give you her. You already got Oprah. Oh, so I'm, I'm down to two. <laughs> but you You're know, Oprah, oh, I'm, I'm I'm delighted that Oprah read my book. But Oprah's sort of like the last person who needs to read my book because I of think course. she I think she's been a, a a force really for for doing all this. Um, I'm going to give more of a kind of conceptual answer. Um, okay because I really would love us to get to a point where our politicians could, could cooperate, and I'm not drawing any equivalences here whatsoever, I'd like Chuck Schumer to read my book. I'd like Mitch McConnell to read my book. Um, those two working in tandem. And now I'm having trouble with a third. I'd like Donald Trump to read my book. All right, I'm gonna send it to those three. Yeah, Donald Trump, Mitch McConnell, and Chuck Schumer. Um, unfortunately, three men, but you know what? I think maybe men need to read this book more than women do. Um, I don't know. But anyway, uh, that, that's just a conceptual answer in terms of uh, trying to get us toward a more collaborative and respectful place. Frank Bruni, thank you for spending all this time with me. And thank you for writing this, this book. I'm excited to share it with some friends, as you know, and, um, and I encourage everyone to, to go out, get the beauty of dusk and uh, it's something we can all relate to. And I think uh, as uh, corny as it sounds, I think the world would be a much better place if people read this book and, and think about the messages in it. So I, I really, I'm grateful for you and, and for your courage in writing this book and sharing it with everyone. Thank you. I'm, I'm grateful for you taking the time to let me you know, prattle on about it. And I'm grateful for our friendship, John. Thank you.